now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We'll hear more of that creaking door from Inner Sanctum Mysteries. This episode goes all the way back to November 20th, 1945. The uh, well-known Broadway actor Martin Gable, uh, the husband of Arlene Francis, uh, will be with this uh, episode, uh, the episode entitled Boomerang. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Come on in, friend. Into the Inner Sanctum. This is really a lovely place. Look kind of dark and cobwebby, but then the maid hasn't been around for some time. No, oh, she was playing the numbers. Then her number came up. <laughs> Why, through these portals pass some of the nicest people in the world. True, they're rather boring, but after all, they are deadheads. <laughs> and I'll take a good old redhead deadhead any time. Get ready to hear a gory little story entitled Boomerang. It's an original radio play written by a couple of Australian bushmen named Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff. And stars Martin Gable in the role of John Keeler. So, hitch up your chair, switch off the lights, and look out. Ah! Help, help me. No one heard me. No one came. I lay there watching the blood ooze from the wound. My chest was on fire. The flesh where the bullet had entered was torn, shredded. And in my back there was a kind of numbness. I screamed, Ah! Help! Help! But no one answered. I was utterly alone. Helpless. Watching my life dripping drop by drop to the floor. Then the blackness closed in. When I regained consciousness, two uniformed patrolmen were bending over me, looking frightened and puzzled. Suicide, Riley? Either that or murder. Their voices seemed to come echoing over an aching void. I wanted to tell them how it happened. I wanted to tell them about Bill Sloan and Helen and the airplane. I was frantic. I had to tell them. He's trying to say something, Rally. Poor guy. He can't talk. He's too far gone. I couldn't talk. I'd lost too much blood. My tongue was thick like cotton. My lips moved, but that was all. It was all shut up inside me. They would never know how it had happened. Riley, it looks to me like murder. Murder, yes, it was murder. And if only I could have spoken, I would have told them. About my nervous breakdown. About the sanitarium. That's where it began, back there in that plushy prison. I was locked up behind that big wall. And my wife and my partner, they had had the chance to discover each other. And then when I came out, the doctor said I was cured. Their false solicitude. And all the while, suspicion was building up inside me. I was already suspicious that day. I caught them by surprise. I come directly home from my regular visit to the psychiatrist instead of returning to the office. Bill was there in the living room with Helen. My partner and my wife laughing together. I closed the front door silently. The rugs muffled my footsteps. I entered the room suddenly, wanting to see their faces when they saw me. Oh, why, why, darling. Hello, Helen. Oh, John, how did you happen to come home in mid-afternoon? Why aren't you at the office? 
I was thinking of asking you that question. Bill made some flimsy excuse, but I caught the look of guilt on his face. He was a bachelor, smooth with words, successful with women. And I was beginning to believe he had succeeded with my wife. Oh, I had evidence. There was the time a few nights later. Helen and I were going up to bed. As we passed the umbrella stand at the foot of the stairs, I noticed something. Helen, Hmm? just a moment. This umbrella, it's Bill's. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. What's it doing here? Well, he must have forgotten it when he was over the other day. Take it out of the office in the morning, will you, darling? I made no reply. We continued up the stairs and went to bed. I waited until Helen was asleep, then crept out of bed and down the stairs. There was the umbrella. I reached out my hand, afraid to touch it, but I had to. The umbrella was still wet. It had rained that afternoon. I said nothing about it the next morning. Oh, I was suspicious enough. But I told myself I had to be absolutely sure. And then, that next night, it happened. Helen went out after dinner, saying she had an appointment with her hairdresser. As the door closed behind her, I picked up the phone and dialed the number. Hello? Crescent Beauty Salon? Alberta, this is Mr. John Keeler. I'm calling for my wife to verify her appointment for this evening. Mrs. Keeler? But, monsieur, she has no appointment for this evening. Now, I was sure. Bill and Helen were together. I struggled to control my emotions. My head was whirling. I felt ill, weak. My heart was pounding in my chest. The room began to spin. First the floor lap, then the chairs, finally the table whirling around my head. I needed air, air. I forced myself out of my seat, stumbled across the floor to the window and threw it open. The stars, too, were spinning, chasing each other in a mad race across the sky. I sucked the fresh air into my lungs, and slowly the stars resumed their normal positions. I drew my head back into the room, and then it struck me across the nostrils. Gas. The room was full of gas. Yes, I found one gas jet open in the kitchen stove. I fought against the logical conclusion, struggled against it all that night and into the next day. But I could no longer stand it by mid-afternoon. That open gas jet last night had been no accident. They were planning to have me put out of the way. Well, two could play at that game. I also could commit murder. I worked out a plan. First... The business trip to Buffalo that I'd been putting off for weeks. I could use that as my alibi. I called my secretary. Yes, Mr. Keeler. Miss Jackson, I've decided to go up to Buffalo tomorrow. Would you get me a drawing room on the five o'clock train? I'll call the railroad station right now, Mr. Keeler. A few minutes later, she called me back. I had the train reservation. So far, so good. I went to the bank, and from the bank to the airline terminal. What can I do for you, sir? I want a seat on the Rochester plane. The plane that leaves New York at 9.30 tomorrow night. 9.30. Hmm? What is the name, sir? Dunham. Roger Dunham. Well, you're a lucky man, Mr. Dunham. It's the last seat on the plane. Roger Dunham. That assumed name would prove my alibi. The details of my scheme were falling into place. I went home, and at dinner told Helen I was leaving for Buffalo tomorrow. Tomorrow? Must you go tomorrow, John? Can't it wait? I've been putting this trip off too long already. I'll leave straight from the office and come home the next afternoon. Well, you're being a little inconsiderate. I'll be all alone here overnight. Oh, come, Helen. You're not afraid of anything, are you? Afraid? No, but Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask Bill to come over and keep you company tomorrow night. How'll that be? Why, why, that'll be fine. Another cog in place. Another gear meshed. Now one last piece to move and the engine of my revenge would be complete. Yes, it was revenge now. Revenge for what those two had done to me. Buffalo, eh? It's a good idea, John. The way your trip could combine business with pleasure. Pleasure? You've been rather tense lately. The change of the scene will do you worlds of good. I'm sure it will. How about Helen? Can you make it tonight? Tonight? Yes. Yes, I'll be over after dinner. That day passed like a dream. With me, the sleepwalker in the center, going through all the motions correctly, but waiting for the evening. For I wasn't hunted now. Now I was the hunter. A little past four o'clock that afternoon, I left the office and took a cab to the station. I went directly to my drawing room, and as the train pulled out, I called for the porter. 
At midnight, sir? Just a glass of milk, Porter. Warm milk. And don't bring it before midnight. Till then, I've got a lot of work to do, and I don't want to be disturbed. Just as you see, sir. I gave the porter an unnecessarily large tip to make sure he'd remember me. Now, when the train stopped to change engines at Harmon an hour later, it was raining. Thunderstorm. I pulled my hat down over my eyes, raised my coat collar around my face, and became just another shadowy figure hurrying to get out of the rain. I crossed the platform unnoticed, and ten minutes later I was on a train going southbound, returning to New York. I picked up my car at the parking lot and drove out to my house on the cliff. Parking on a side road, I climbed up the hill on foot. By now the rain was coming down in sheets. Lightning split the sky and thunder crashed around me. I could see the light from my house perched at the edge of the cliff. Now Bill's car was parked on the driveway, pointed downhill. Light came from the living room. I crept through the shrubbery to a window. There they were, Bill and Helen. My partner and my wife, sitting side by side on the divan. He drinking my whiskey, comfortable and warm, while I, the unwanted, was standing outside in the storm. How I hated him at that moment. I went back to Bill's car, crept beneath it, and went to work. The sound of the storm covered the noise of my tools as I disconnected the brakes. And I was finished. And none too soon, for suddenly the front door opened, and Bill stood framed in the light of the doorway with Helen behind him. Bad night for it, but we'll never get another chance like this one, Helen. Well, all right, but come back quickly, Bill. I'm nervous. Oh, nothing to be nervous about. John is halfway to Buffalo by now. It's a perfect opportunity to go over our plans with Bates. All right, go ahead, then. But hurry. I'll have Bates back here in a jiffy. Bates. Bates. He was going to fetch Bates, undoubtedly a hired killer. I laughed inwardly as the car got started. I could see Helen watching it as it picked up speed on the steep downgrades. Something was wrong now, and she knew it. Bill, not the car! Too late, too late. The car was roaring downhill out of control. Charges were on the lip of the cliff. There was a crash and smash through the car. Bill! Bill! Oh, poor Bill. I always say, protect me from my friends and I'll take care of my enemies. Such a nice guy, too. Who would have thought he'd go falling for a cliff? But there you are. There's no accounting for tastes. November 20th, 1945, Inner Sanctum Mysteries on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now more of Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Boomerang, starring Martin Gable, November 20th, 1945. Well, don't relax yet. First, let's go back to that tiff on the cliff where John Keeler has just killed his business partner. I'm just itching to know what's going to happen to his wife. She's standing by the shattered fence, peering down the side of the cliff into the darkness. And John, he's creeping up behind her. Look out, Helen. He's dead, Helen. Oh. It's a sheer drop of 400 feet to the bottom. John! I thought... John, you said you were going to Buffalo. I am going to Buffalo, Helen, after I finish my business here. Well, well uh, Bill, the, the car... It was a just... pity about the brakes. They must have come disconnected. Disconnected? Accidents will happen, Helen. John. John, you killed him. You and Bill thought you would pull the wool over my eyes. Well, I fooled you. Stay away from me. I'm going to throw you over the cliff. I'm going to send you to join your lover. You can't do that. Tomorrow they'll find your bodies. They'll think you were thrown clear of the car when it crashed. They'll call it an unfortunate accident. No, no, please, Careful, John. Helen, you're at the edge. There's nothing behind you. John, John, don't touch me. John! Goodbye, Helen. If I had any feeling at that moment, it was a feeling of satisfaction. I, the failure, had committed the perfect crime. My scheme was flawless. I walked down the hill to my car, changed my clothes, and drove to the airport. As Roger Dunham, I boarded the plane for Rochester at 9.30 that night. Just as I'd planned it, we arrived at that city well ahead of my train. I was waiting when the long line of sleeping cars pulled in at the Rochester station platform. I boarded the train. My drawing room was just as I had left it at Harmon. I sank down 
in a seat. Removed my coat and shoes. I looked at my watch. It was midnight. Uh, come in. Uh, beg pardon, sir. It's midnight, sir. Oh, midnight? Really? Oh, thanks for bringing the milk. It's lukewarm, sir, just like you asked for it. Thank you, Porter. In Buffalo, I went to my usual hotel, checked in, went to sleep. Oddly enough, I slept well that night. A deep, dreamless sleep. In fact, I overslept. For when I wakened, it was broad daylight and the phone was ringing. I, uh... uh I struggled out of bed, lifted the receiver. Uh, hello. This is the long distance operator. I have a New York City call for Mr. John Keeler. This is Mr. Keeler speaking. One moment, please. Here's your party. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Uh, this is Miss Jackson. I've just arrived at the office. Mr. Keeler, I don't know how to tell you. The police. What about the police? They're here in the office. They want you to return at once. Miss Keeler, what's going on there? Mr. Sloan and your wife. Both of them are dead, Mr. Keeler. Dead? Mr. Sloan's car went off the cliff near your house last night. The accident was discovered this morning. Accident? You say it was an accident? It must have been an accident, Mr. Keeler. She thought it was an accident. Now, if only the police thought likewise. I told my secretary I'd take the first plane back to the city, and I hung up. A few hours later, I reached New York, hurried to my office. There's a detective waiting in your office, Mr. Keeler. A detective? He said he had to see you. A detective. This was the test. I pulled myself together and opened the door to my office. Mr. Keeler? Yes. I understand you're from police headquarters. Jerome is the name, sir. Assistant inspector. How do you do, sir? We won't take up much of your time, Mr. Keeler. It's an open and shut case. How do you mean that? Well, stormy night, slippery road, bad breaks... Obviously an accident. I'm very sorry. I nodded at the detective. And all the while I was laughing inwardly. He sat there, the very symbol of the law, and offered me official sympathy. No question of clues, nothing overlooked, nothing to fear. Not now. I, the weakling, had committed the perfect crime. Yes, Miss Jackson? Mr. Keeler, there's a man out here to see you. Send him away. He won't go. He says you don't know him, but it's extremely important. What's his name? His name is Bates, Mr. Keeler. William Bates. Bates? The hired killer. I told my secretary I'd see him. I went into the outer office. Bates was sitting on one of the chairs with an open briefcase on his lap. He was a big man. Tough looking. I read the news in the morning paper, Mr. Keeler. Too bad. That was a tough break. Yes. Yes, was. I didn't know if I should go after you now, but... Well, uh, after all, I'm a businessman. My time is money. I'm sure it is, but why tell me about it? You certainly don't expect me to pay you. Why not? They're your plans. My plans? Well, look at them. Here they are. Why, well, they've even got your name on them. I didn't know whether I could trust my ears. Whether I could believe my vision. Bates drew a roll of architectural drawings out of his briefcase... And shoved them at me. Look at them. There it is in your partner's handwriting. Plans for the new Keeler house. Who are you? I told you. My name is Bates. I'm a building contractor. Your partner and your wife insisted that the whole job had to be done in secret. In secret? They said something about you having just come out of a sanitarium. They wanted the whole thing to be a big surprise. My mind was reeling. The secret meetings that led me to suspect Bill and Helen... Those meetings were to go over the plans for a house. My house and Helen's. I had killed my best friend and my wife. Inspector Jerome, I want to confess. I killed them. I killed them. Killed them? Killed who? Don't look at me like that. You know who I'm talking about. My partner and my wife. I killed them last night. Now I'm ready to take my punishment. Now, calm down, Mr. Keeler. You've had a hard time. We realize this thing has been a great shock. What are you talking about? The homicide squad doesn't jump to hasty conclusions, Mr. Keeler. We made a thorough checkup on your background. What's my background got to do with it? Well, we know you spent three months in a sanatorium recuperating from a nervous collapse. Now, on top of that, this unfortunate it accident. It wasn't an accident. I killed him. We checked every movement you made since you left the office yesterday. Then you must know. We know you took the five o'clock train to Buffalo. The porter on your pullman had no trouble recalling you. Why, well, he even told us how he brought you a glass of milk at midnight. 
You were a good 200 miles away from New York when the accident happened. The detective went away, shaking his head. <laughs> Sympathetically. My mind was in a turmoil. I had committed the perfect crime, and it had boomeranged. Martin Gable probably best remembered to radio listeners as the narrator on CBS Radio's Norman Corwin broadcast on a note of triumph. November 20th, 1945, Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Thanks for joining us here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of Inner Sanctum Mysteries, November 20th, 1945, Boomerang, starring Martin Gable. I went home. The house on the cliff was empty. Everywhere I looked, I saw Helen. Her photograph on my desk. Her red-tipped cigarette still in the ashtrays. Two half-empty cocktail glasses side by side on the living room table. There was desolation in the house. Emptiness. Loneliness. And it would be like this for the rest of my life. But there was one way out. I always kept a loaded gun in the desk. I took it out of the drawer in my hand. Here was my punishment. This time I couldn't fail. I placed the gun against my chest... And pulled the trigger. I fell by the desk and lay there, where I am now. Staining the carpet with my blood. I was dying, and I was glad of it. And then I remembered the plane. The plane reservation to Rochester. I could tell the police when they came, and they could check that, and they would know that I was guilty. But they came too late. They bent over me. I tried to tell them. I tried. I tried. Riley, he's trying to say something. Yeah, poor guy. He's too far gone to talk. Now I'm lying here on the carpet, waiting to die, with my guilt locked up inside me. I can see a new figure among the police. A man in civilian dress with a small black bag in his hand. How long is it since this man was discovered in this condition, officer? About half an hour, Doc. He's in very bad shape. Will he live, Doc? Will he recover? Oh, yes. He may recover, but only partially. Partially? How do you mean, Doc? Notice his inability to move so much as a finger. Notice how only his lips move, trying to form words without being able to speak. The bullet must have injured his spinal cord. This man is paralyzed. Totally paralyzed. So now I know. I'm paralyzed. I'm not going to die. And yet I can see the policemen moving carefully about the room. And I hear them speaking softly as one speaks in the presence of the dead. So I've failed again. For the last time. Because I know my fate now. To live in this living death. Alone with my guilt. Forever. That is my punishment. Keeler. Who would have thought his spinal cord could have tied him up in knots? Not so nice for John, hmm? <laughs> He started out as a Keeler, tried to be a Keeler dealer, but got all wound up. <laughs> Mr. Host, let's forget about that awful story, because there's something really important I'd like to talk about. The makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup want me to remind all you folks of a debt that must be paid to our servicemen. A debt that can be paid in part by buying and continuing to buy victory bonds. You know, I think the best reason for buying bonds was given many, many years ago by one of the great statesmen of all time, by Abraham Lincoln, when he said, 
Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Yes, folks, that's just what we're helping to do when we invest in victory bonds. So keep on buying all that you can, won't you? And now, friends, for those of you who like morals for your drama, here's one for tonight. Never mix your partner's business with your pleasure. For if you do, he may consider it a pleasure to give you the business. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, Next week's story is about a genius, a photographer who believes that death can be beautiful. So he only takes pictures of people who are in the throes of dying. It's enough to make your camera shutter. And naturally, he has to arrange his models, arrange to have them die. So next Tuesday, bring along the kiddies and we'll make it a nice family picture. <laughs> And now it's time to close the squeaking door. So, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm. <laughs> From November 20th, 1945, Inner Sanctum Mysteries on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of Captain Midnight. This episode from November 20th, 1939. The Skelly Oil Company presents Captain Midnight. Captain Midnight, brought to you every day, Monday through Friday, at the same time, by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Jobbers and Dealers. The Skelly Oil Company, you know, was the originator of tailor-made gasoline. Gasoline that's weather right for your car. See, fellas and girls, here's one that'll tickle your funny bone. What would you think if you saw a man walk out into a snowstorm wearing a swimming suit and a derby hat? Well, I'll bet you'd say the man ought to have his head examined, wouldn't you? But you know, your family car may be just as unprepared for your weather as that man in the swimming suit if your car is using the wrong gasoline. I mean, gasoline that isn't weather right. So ask Dad tonight if the gasoline he uses is changed to fit the weather or if his gasoline is the same now as it was last summer when the temperature was 100 in the shade. Now... That's really a very important question, because gasoline that's made for summer use just doesn't have the zip and snap a motor needs for quick starting and smooth performance in cold weather. You want gasoline that's made to suit your weather. Well, there is such a gasoline, and it's called Skelly TaylorMade Aeromax. It's weather right because it's tailor-made for quick starting and top performance at the time and the place where you buy it. You see... Skelly Aeromax gasoline is tailor-made for each section of the country where it's sold and for the changing seasons of the year. You can always be sure Skelly Aeromax will suit your weather. So tell your dad all about Skelly tailor-made Aeromax gasoline tonight. Try it and see if it doesn't give you quicker starts and smoother performance than the gasoline you've been using. Say, dad and mother will be proud to find out you know so much about driving and they'll both be glad you told them about skelly tailor-made aeromax gasoline have them try it tonight and now to captain at night by subjecting dolores pareda to a third degree inquisition ivan shark tricked her into giving away the secret of the location of the pareda treasure while this was taking place Captain Midnight, Chuck Ramsey, and Senor Pareda were working desperately to open a hole in the cave-in of the rock wall, barring their progress in the secret passageway under the hacienda. Let's see how they're getting along. 
Senor Pareda is holding a pocket flashlight, which provides light for the labors of Captain Midnight and Chuck. And one by one, the stones come off with a thud. Listen as Captain Midnight says in a low voice. All right, wait, wait. Uh, hold it a second, Chuck. Key okay, Red. Wait till I get rid of this rock. All right. Ah, mi amigos. We are making the headway. It will not be long now. Well, that's what I wanted to find out. You don't think we have far to go then, senor? No, mi capitan. This barricade, it is not a great one. About how thick do you think it is? Three or four feet, senor. No more. We ought to be about through then, huh? I think we are. Now put your hand here, where we've been working. Huh? Oh, yes, Chuck. Yes, you're right. I do feel something. I feel a draft. That is good. Yes, we must be almost through. Ah, I thank the merciful Dios. Soon perhaps I shall see my daughter, Dolores. Listen, senor. Did there used to be much of a draft down this passageway? No, mi capitan. Only if the outer door was open. Then there couldn't be any draft at all if that door was closed. Well, that's the way we left it. Blades and beacons, that's right. We drew the door shut after we came in. But there could be a draft if there was an opening at the other end, ahead of us. See, that could be possible. All right, now we've got to work fast. Here, hold the flashlight for me, senor. While I continue taking out these rocks. Oh, Chuck. Yeah? Do you think you can find your way back to the door through which we came? Well, sure, Red. I can find it all right. All right. Now, you make your way back there slowly and quietly. See whether it's open or closed. Get back here as quickly as possible and listen. Be careful. Okay, Red. I'll be right back. All right. I do not like this, senor. It is not good. Let's not jump at any conclusions, senor, until Chuck gets back. All right, now then. There's more of these rocks. Look, mi capitan. There is this small hole. Yes. Yes, we're beginning to get through, all right. Perhaps we shall be able to surprise this Ivan Shark yeah, soon. That's what I'm hoping. Now, tell me, senor, about the secret door in the library. Say, mi capitan. At one end of the library, behind the screen, there's the long bookcase on the wall. Uh -huh. One section of this bookcase is the door. Yeah, very good, senor. How does that door open? On the panels between the sections, there are the carvings. The English word is gargoyle. Oh, yes, yes, of course, gargoyles. And the hidden button is somewhere on the head? See, si, senor. It is necessary to press the left eyeball. Yeah, see. Si. And uh, how do you open it from the passageway side? There is the lever which comes out from the wall. It is not hidden. No, it wouldn't need to be on that side. Now, tell me, you say Ivan Shark uses the library as his headquarters? See, si, mi capitan. He uses it as the office. He is there much of the time. I see. Red. Oh, Red. Yes, Chuck. Yes, Chuck. Yes, what is it? The door, Red. It's open. What? The door is open. Ah, senors, we are discovered. Hold on now. Let's not jump at conclusions. Oh, gosh, Red. Our plane's outside. What are we yes, going to do? Yes, Chuck, I'm thinking about that. Mi amigos, what shall we do? Do you suppose, Red, that door could have opened itself? Uh, I doubt it. It works easily, but I don't think there was enough draft to open it. Gosh, and it's a strong draft now. Yes, I know. I've got quite a hole opened up here, Chuck. Almost large enough for us to crawl through. Oh, gee, Red, just when we were getting along so well. There's no time for idle talk, Chuck. Come on, let's go. Oh, you're right, Red. I'm sorry. What shall we do, senor? First, we've got to protect ourselves from the rear and be sure we're not being followed. Without using the light, we'll creep slowly and quietly back to the door. All right, now loosen your gun so you can get at them quickly. When we get there, we won't go outside. We'll stay inside the door with our backs pressed against the wall. And we'll wait and see if anyone comes or goes. After that, if all is well, we will continue. And at the same moment, nearby in the hacienda above, sits Ivan Shark in the library. His eyes are studying the chart on the desk before him while a leer of satisfaction lights up his evil features. Suddenly, the door opens. Is that you, Gardo? Yeah, Chief. Where's Fang? Ah, uh, he's making a tour of inspection. Ah, oh, yes. I told him to do that every hour. Very well, then. Close the door and come here. Okay, Chief. What have you done with the Senorita Pareda? I put her in that underground chamber, Chief. There ain't no way for her to get out. You mean the one in which we found her kneeling by the chest? Yeah, that's the one, Chief. Hmm. <laughs> she will not last long there, Gardo. It is damp and the air is bad. But now that I've found out what I wish to know, it does not matter. Well, uh, are you sure you know, Chief? Never more sure in my life, Gardo. We know the treasure is in the Aztec Temple. And we also know from this chart that it lies in an underground chamber. Yeah, but, but it's a cinch it ain't in plain sight, Chief. Ah, that does not matter in the least, Gardo. As long as I know what room it is in, I will find any secret compartment or hiding place. Yeah, <laughs> you're good at that stuff, Chief. Yeah, I never would have found the secret door in this library. Now then, Gardo, at the first sign of daylight... You and I will make a trip to the temple. We must waste no time in getting this treasure. Okay, Chief. But uh, what about Captain Midnight and that crowd up in the valley? Hmm. 
<laughs> we can take care of them at our leisure, Gardo. Rossman and his men have them surrounded on the ground. Yeah, but don't forget, Chief. Captain Midnight has that black two-seater. I remember that well, Gardo. But you will instruct our pilots to maintain constant control. They are not to allow that black two-seater to take off from the dried lake bed. Okay, Chief, I'll tell them. As soon as we have the treasure, then our pilots will drive the great herd of cattle through the northern pass, where they are to be delivered. Have you uh, got the deal all set on that? Yes, Gardo. Everything is arranged. The cattle must be driven down our valley, then through the pass which you have seen from the air. As soon as they are on the other side of the pass, I will have completed my bargain. Yeah, <laughs> that's a new one, Chief. Driving cattle by airplanes. <laughs> it ought to work all right, too. Yes, Gardo. Five airplanes will be worth a hundred cowboys. When the cattle hear the roar of the motors, they will move and move fast. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be a regular stampede. That's what it'll be. Yes, that's what I wish. We will waste no time. No. Uh, do you know who this guy is you're dealing with? Ah, oh, yes, Gardo. I know him very well. He is a gentleman with my own outlook on life. He is anxious to make a quick fortune, and he will ask no questions. Yeah, that's the kind of a gent to do business with. Now then, Gardo, I have constructed another map to be used with this chart. I wish you to study it with me so that we can settle on the details of our flight to the temple. Now you will notice this point. I believe we can land not very far from... Again, we return to Captain Midnight, Chuck Ramsey, and Senor Pereira. They are standing with their backs pressed against the wall inside the open door of the underground passageway. Listen as Chuck says. I don't think anyone's coming now. We do not have the time to lose, Senor. Yeah, that's true enough. My guess is we don't have more than two hours before daybreak. That's about right. So we'll have to work fast. Shall we go back in or... Well, I... Wait a minute. Quiet. Something's coming. Hold your position. If there aren't too many, we'll jump them. There's only one. All right, now, tackle his legs, Chuck. Here I go. Oh, I got his arm. I got his leg. I have their feet, senor. Wait a minute. I guess we've got him, all right? Hold it. Hold it. Now, wait. There may be others on the way. Hold it. I don't hear anything else. He must be all alone. It is strange, senor. This man here has not said the word. How about the flashlight, Red? You think it's safe to use it? Wait a minute. Let's drag him inside a ways first. Okay. All right, now, all together. Get a hold of him here. Come on. <laughs> Uh, this ought to be far enough, don't you think, Red? Yes, yes, I think so. We are many steps from the dorm, we copy uh, time. Where's the flashlight? Senor Pereira has it. All right, senor. Let's see what we've got here. See, senor. That's it. Uh, Turn his head up. There. Uh, uh, Chuck, look. What? It's the pilot we rescued from the crashed plane. The one who escaped from us. Uh, who is this man, mi amigo? I told you about him, senor. Remember the pilot of the wrecked airplane? Si, si. Now I remember. Gosh, Red. We couldn't get him to say a word before, and he probably won't now. Yeah, well, wait. I'll find out. You... What's your name? What are you doing here? He's shaking his head. Look, senors. He moves the hand. Lincoln Beacon's red. Look at that. He pointed to his mouth and shook his head. Then he pointed to his ear and shook his head again. Hmm. I thought he was trying to deceive us the other time, Chuck, but well, I'm not so sure now. Uh, look. He's making another motion. Yeah. He moves the finger against the other hand, senors. He tells us he wished to write the letter. Mm -hmm. That's it, Red. That's just what he's doing. Well, wait. Who's got a piece of paper? Well, here's that little notebook I carry. Oh, good. I'll open it to a blank page. Here, me, amigo. I have the pants. That's the stuff. That's all I give them to him there. Gosh, he's writing all right. I wonder what he's saying. He has finished. Well, he's handing it to you, Red. Yes, here. I'll read what he's written. My name is Zoling. I am a pilot for Ivan Sharp. Now he's writing something more. Oh, gosh. We knew he was a pilot for Ivan Sharp. All we found out is his name. Look, he is writing very fast. He knows exactly what he wishes to tell us. Yes. Uh, uh, uh. There, he gives it to you. He's getting up. Hey! Quick, stop him. Stop or I'll shoot. Hold it, Chuck, hold it. He can't hear you. You can't shoot a man in the back. Besides, after looking at this note, this may mean salvation for us, Chuck. Or it may mean a fight much sooner than we expected. All right, come on, let's go. We'll find out soon enough. Well... The mysterious pilot again makes his appearance. And we know something that Captain Midnight does not know. The pilot Zollinger has helped Captain Midnight by giving a false report to Ivan Sharp. And say, what is the note he has left behind? Tune in tomorrow to Captain Midnight. Now, don't forget to tune in again tomorrow, same time, same station, for further transcribed adventures of Captain Midnight, brought to you by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Jobbers and Dealers. Is the mute pilot Zollinger turning traitor to his chief, Ivan Shark? Or is this merely one of the master criminal's tricks 
to lure Captain Midnight and his friends farther underground. Be sure to listen tomorrow. Until then, this is Don Gordon, your Skelly Man, saying goodbye and happy landing! November 20th, 1939, Captain Midnight here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, visit our webpage, classicradio.stream, where you can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about Classic Radio Collecting. You can find our social media links. You can find links to uh, places you can download our shows from. You can contact me. And if you enjoy what we do, you can buy me a coffee. The buy me a coffee money helps us acquire additional Classic Radio Collections for us to bring to you here on your favorite station, and it also helps us refine our distribution channels. That's at ClassicRadio.Stream, ClassicRadio.Stream. Please thank this station and support their advertisers, and most importantly, tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.